want to thank Standard Process too for having me and uh, being able to sort of um, share with you some hard-won knowledge uh, that has taken almost a decade to accumulate, but it very much sort of intersects with a lot of the themes that you've heard today, uh, in addition to all of the new research that's been going on in Standard Process. And in some ways, this is a clinical overlay to much of the science that you've heard up until now. And some of that science is really complicated. Um, my experience in the field began when I was 17 years old. And I began my formal training in Japanese five element shiatsu and traditional Chinese medicine. Most of my instructors were from Japan and China. And so I was originally a manual therapist operating in that mode. I did shiatsu and tui na and Thai massage and traditional Chinese medicine and so on and so forth uh, before I decided to partially lose my mind and go to medical school. <laughs> um, so for many years then, uh, you know, my, my toolkit kept expanding and was beginning to develop a real clinical confidence around, well, what is this model of integrative care? And I added the ability to write prescriptions and refer to specialists and speak the conventional language in addition to the other sort of health-related languages that I had accumulated over time. Um, but I felt like at some point there was a false sense of confidence, especially after having left University of Michigan where I was there for 16 years building an academic-based integrated medicine program, and then eventually bought a private practice in Virginia, and I was starting to see patients that were not only really sick, but also escaping many of the therapies that I had found worked well in the past. And I would quote, fix the gut and balance their hormones and deal with adrenal fatigue and so on and so forth. And yet, when I threw in acupuncture needles and taught breathing techniques and all the other pieces, uh, including writing prescriptions, there was a core group of patients that just wouldn't get better. And so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board to ask why. What was really wrong with this group that typically presented with a primary symptom of fatigue, usually pain and weight gain, um, but we couldn't really find a source or cause, that many of our standard markers were normal, often our functional labs were essentially normal, and this core group, this irreducible nugget of individuals just would not get better. And you know this group, you know the labels, the chronic fatigue, the fibromyalgia, the atypical depression, the resistant obesity, um, all of these labels that we give these individuals that we know we kind of work around the edges, and we kind of hold them together with the nutrition and the supplements and the medications, but we never quite make great progress with them. The labs never really fully return to normal. So we began to do more deep research to ask the question, why? What's going on with them metabolically? What's going on with them physiologically? And over time, we cultivated this idea of chronic inflammatory response syndrome, this notion that the body has ignited inflammation. We talk about this all the time, but being an academic as well, I always ask the question, well, what kind of inflammation are we talking about? You know, it's not sort of a ubiquitous term. It's not a single event. There are different kinds of inflammation that can potentially be generated in the body. So what were we really dealing with? And it turns out that we had to look into an area of the immune system that was not often investigated in clinical medicine. We are much better describing cardiometabolic disease in terms of elevated CRP and SED rate, as well as autoimmune processes. So we can run an ANA and autoimmune antibodies, and we can identify when a patient has rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or general inflammation because they're overweight and their visceral fat is acting as an engine for cytokines. But it turned out all that was normal in these patients. So instead, we looked in what's called the innate immune system. And this is the primal part of the immune response, which harbors neutrophils and macrophages. It's the early response to an immune threat. And this is where the magic was, that in fact, there were markers that were elevated, but they remained persistently elevated, which was abnormal. The innate immune response should turn on, then turn off, and hand off to the adaptive side of the immune, the immune system, where T cells and B cells are located so that you can get some resolution. So what we found is that, number one, it was the innate immune system that was turning on, and number two, it was not turning off. And the question was, well, why? We didn't really understand that until we started looking at genes associated with the bridge, 
between the two sides of the immune response, the innate and the adaptive. And the bridge are what are called antigen-presenting cells. Dr. Trope had quickly mentioned that. These are specialized macrophages that grab on to a threat and snip an epitope, a small protein sequence. It absorbs it and then presents it to a T cell. And the T cells, ah, OK, now I know I'm supposed to turn on because I'm being presented this epitope. T cells upregulate their activity. They then stimulate B cells to produce antibodies. And we have that more sophisticated adaptive response. It turns out that this group of people have poor antigen presentation, that basically they're born with gene sequences where their antigen presenting cells are inefficient. So what that really means is once the innate immune system turns on, they don't hand off to the other side of the immune system, and they remain persistently inflamed. But the story didn't stop there. The story gets even more complicated. But that's where we began. And we found markers in the innate immune response that created a new language for this inflammation, ones that I had not really f heard of before, but we began investigating. Dr. Trope had also mentioned he used the term proteomics. These are special, specialized proteins that we can find in the blood that reference this innate immune activation. So we began building this model. A percentage of individuals who are chronically inflamed, they have poor handoff to the adaptive immune system, and they can't turn it off. It's a syndrome in the sense that the whole body becomes inflamed. Every system is affected. And just about every symptom that you could imagine could be potentially contained in this patient population. The hallmarks, interestingly, are just what Dr. Boniker talked about. Weight gain, pain, depression, fatigue. It was all there. And now we found a map of maybe why a portion of those patients that received those labels began to develop those symptoms. So, the model then was abnormal proteomics, meaning abnormal immune response. Even more complicated, and I know you started off the day with this, is abnormal transcriptomics. This is the new language of science. This will be the new language of clinical medicine, but it's a language that most of us have not been exposed to. It begins with the genes, which are DNA sequences. We inherit our instruction set. But the DNA is active. It's alive. It is shaped by our environment. It is shaped by predisposing factors, even in utero. And genes turn on and off. And the way that they express is through what we call the transcriptome, which is RNA. That's the messenger set off the DNA. And interestingly, you can have defects with genes that you inherit, but you can also have defects in the way genes express. So you can get abnormal production of RNA. And then the RNA goes to the ribosome. The ribosome translates the RNA and makes proteins. So that's the proteome. And then finally, proteins are assembled into small molecules, which is called the metabolome. This is the new language, the genome, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome. And it's the on-off functions of genes and how it's influenced by epigenetics that creates this total expression. It turns out that in this patient population, not only are they vulnerable to chronic inflammation, but the inflammation itself influences gene expression. These genes turn on like light switches, hundreds of them, and they won't turn off. So this is the secondary issue in this patient population is that it's not just the exciting event that creates the inflammation. The inflammation itself changes how genes function. So these patients establish this chronic inflammation all the way down to the gene level, and we're going to come back to that. The result is abnormal regulation of the immune system, abnormal regulation of hormone function, and these diseases all, are all, are all around you. And the reason why I say that is because it turns out, remember when I said there are people who inherit poor antigen presentation? They stay stuck in their innate immune system? That's 22% of the population. 22%, two out of 10 people that you see in your practice, probably more, who are complaining of fatigue and weight gain and pain-related symptoms and digestive complaints and cardiovascular issues, they're in this category. It's 40 million people. 
And so this is not sort of a small isolated idea. It's incredibly common in terms of what we call penetrance, the epidemiology of how common is this gene in the population. So <clears throat> this includes not just people who are predisposed to this, the 40 million, but we have to ask the question, well, what turned on this inflammation to begin with? In this category, what we found is that these are organisms, are parts of organisms that we call biotoxins. These are living sequences that trigger the immune response. So infections, mycotoxins, hyphal elements, other, um, other living organisms that we find in water-damaged buildings, things that swim around in the ocean that we inadvertently consume, poor dentition, a whole variety of biological toxins that trigger this inflammation. This is not toxins collo colloquially that we consider heavy metals and chemicals, these sort of inert but dangerous substances that interfere with the machinery of the body. Instead, these are living things that trigger this immune response. So it's very unique in that regard, which also unfortunately includes Lyme. So Lyme is one of the common pathogens that will turn on this inflammation. And if unfortunately Lyme bumps into the 20%, this inflammation is ignited all the way down to the gene level and the genes won't turn off, which means the symptoms are perpetual. It also means that if you remove the exposure, if you eliminate the biotoxin and you're in the 20%, the person remains sick. If you give them antimicrobials and you kill their Lyme and their co-infections, they remain sick. If they move out of the moldy environment, they remain sick. If you deal with any of the biotoxins, however you do that, they remain sick. So one of the falsities is that everything that looks and smells like Lyme is Lyme. The other is that if you have con continuing symptoms, they must, quote, still be infected. It's not true. Interestingly, what do you think the data is on the larger randomized controlled trials where they did look at a Lyme population, they treated with antibiotics, what percent of people do you think remain sick after therapy? 20%. That number is very persistent in the literature, not just in Lyme, in a lot of illnesses. And we think it's because of this issue. Lyme is very hard to diagnose, which is why people say, oh, well, you still have symptoms, you must still have Lyme. It's not true. So unfortunately, the testing for Lyme is difficult. It's not really well validated. Our standard tests for ELISA and Western blot basically miss up to 70% of patients. There are better tests hitting the market, but many aren't great. So how do we build a model to identify these people? And here are the 30 entities. I'm sure you've heard of beta-glucans, mannins, spirocyclic dimines, lipopolysaccharide, actinomycetes, VOCs, MVOCs, hyphal fragments, cell wall fragments. These are common, right? You think about these all the time. Sure. <laughs> and yet these are the things that people can encounter that ignite this inflammation. And if they're in the 20%, bad things happen. And the list is growing. So now we're up to maybe 40. But common things are common. Mold in sort of all of its forms in water damaged buildings, because it's not just mold that grows, is probably the most common that people encounter. And what's interesting is that the body has a sort of general but messy uniform response, that the inflammation is ubiquitous and it creates a whole list of symptoms. We've tested patients and published studies on asking them, can they guess what the original exposure was or is based on how they feel? And they say, oh, sure, no problem. I've seen lists that say, because I have joint pain and stretch marks and brain fog, I must have Lyme. Well, we know they can't guess. We know that it doesn't matter which of the 30 or 40 triggers that are out there. It generates a long list of symptoms. So don't get fooled by how people feel. They feel miserable. There are lots of symptoms that are generated, but we can't tell based on how they feel what the original trigger is or was. Some of the common complaints are fatigue, headaches, unusual sensations, neurologic issues, shortness of breath, cough, digestive complaints, palpitations, 
weight gain, mood disturbances, cognitive decline, like memory loss, lots of pain, pain-related syndromes, in addition to temperature problems, sweats, thirst and uh, urinary frequency, vertigo, it goes on and on and on. We identified 13 categories of symptoms that patients typically present in. And we know that if patients have at least one symptom in eight of the 13, we have a very high likelihood of already diagnosing them that they're in the 20% population. But think about this. Do you have patients that complain of weight gain, digestive complaints, and pain? Sure. Do you have patients that complain of depression, anxiety, uh, mental fatigue, and sleeplessness? Sure. Do you have patients with, quote, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, leaky gut? It's this list. Do you typically test those patients and find that oftentimes nothing is really wrong with them? I mean, sure, they might have some nutrient deficiencies or presence of heavy metals or, you know, some leakiness in the gut. But when you deal with those issues, do all of their symptoms resolve? No. And they end up on a list of things that kind of hold them together. Adaptogens, maybe some gut support, maybe bioidentical hormone replacement. They see their energy worker, their acupuncturist, and they're also on an antidepressant and an anti-inflammatory and even worse, a narcotic and usually a sleep aid. You know the list. We all see these patients all day long. So what is our evaluation process to better understand do they fall in this category? It's actually pretty straightforward. We give them a symptom questionnaire to see do they fall into that 13 categories. The next is we do our laboratory evaluation, meaning proteomics, which I'll talk about. We then have them do a special visual test, which is a direct measure of inflammation in the brain. It takes 10 minutes. It's 15 bucks. It's easy to do. It's one of the best and most robust direct measures of neurologic inflammation that we have clinically. It's called a visual contrast study. We then do an HMP and an exposure history. We then verify when all of this comes back. In tier one, do they have a known exposure? Did you do your differential diagnosis to rule out other causes? And then um, are they positive in at least eight of 13 clusters of symptoms? We know alone if they fail their visual test and they have eight of 13 symptoms um, positive, we have a 98.3% sensitivity that they're in this category, just symptoms and visual test alone. Easy to do. We then look at tier two, three of six, more objective markers. Did they fail their visual test? Do they have presence of those gene sequences that create poor antigen presentation? There's nine of them on chromosome six within their HLA. We also look at some other markers that you might not have heard of. MMP9, these are produced by macrophages. These are part of the matrix metalloproteinase family, which actually break down, breaks down connective tissue. In addition to one of the most important hormones that you might not have heard of called MSH, melanocyte stimulating hormone. This is a master control hormone. It's one of the most important hormones in the body that controls um, pain levels, as well as general inflammation and other aspects of our physiology. And then imbalances in ACTH cortisol. So we see cortisol levels go up. And ADH, so people can't regulate the water content in their body. So they're typically very thirsty and peeing frequently. We then um, confirm two of three, symptom improvement with treatment. They pass their visual test as a result of good treatment. And then finally, finally resolution of their laboratory symptoms. And then there's diagnostic refinement, meaning well, what were they exposed to? We do some specialized testing for Lyme. We use a urine test called NanoTrap. I think it's a lot better than the standard test. We also have patients swab their home for mold. This is called an ERMI test, the Environmental Relative Moldy Index, which is very accurate. It's based on PCR technology, better than air sampling. Sometimes patients are so short of breath and winded and losing exercise tolerance that we have them do cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Turns out that one of the features of the illness is capillary constriction, poor peripheral blood flow and therefore they lose their exercise tolerance and their VO2 max uh, puts them in the category of uh, stage two to three congestive heart failure. So they're quite tired. We then look at their brains. This is really important. So this gets up to this idea of neuroinflammation being one of the final common pathways in this patient population, which I'll talk about. 
uh, called NeuroQuant, and then transcriptomics. And that's maybe one of our, our most important, exciting breakthroughs. So they have poor antigen presentation. Here are the nine sequences that we've identified that make people vulnerable to these biotoxins. Uh, there is an interpretation tool on a website called survivingmold.com to do this. You can actually order this through standard lab tests. We then have them do the visual test. Uh, this is a direct reflection of visual uh, or neurologic inflammation. Uh, basically, uh, the brain loses contrast capacity or what we call color discrimination when the brain becomes more and more inflamed. It's a result of optic nerve inflammation. This test was developed really 50 years ago by the military, and it was designed to quickly assess whether or not an individual or community had an exposure to a biotoxin. It's incredibly reliable. There's a lot of research on it. It's a quick and dirty 30,000 foot view of saying, is this brain on fire? And we know when the innate immune system is ignited, don't forget, that includes macrophages, of course, but the specialized macrophages of the brain called microglial cells. So this ends up truly being a brain on fire phenomenon. We also know in a treated population, and this is our data, that if you treat Lyme patients, 20% of them will fail the visual test because they haven't turned off the fire. This is what the results look like. It's a grid. They cover one eye, complete the test, and then they cover the other eye and do the same thing. And you can pass one eye and fail the other. That's still a fail. Um, we also know that no matter how on fire a brain is, 9% of people can pass this test, that they're just really good with color, and they can you know, beat the test regardless. So this is why with our diagnostic criteria, it's not just visual test alone that puts people in the category, that they have other changes that we identify. But if you have someone who fails the test, it's brain on fire. It's neurologic inflammation. So this proteomics, you've heard this before. I mentioned it as well. This is a subset of these innate immune markers that go up as a result of the fire in the brain. And it all results from what we call our biotoxin pathway. And I'll go through this quickly. So basically, we have the fire here, which is the people in the 20%, they turn on dendritic cells, they turn on microglial cells, and there's a cytokine storm in the brain. Yep. It is. Um, if they've passed before, it's not as helpful. It's not as helpful because there's a threshold. Because there's a threshold to it. Yeah. So what happens in the brain? Well, there's a cytokine storm with the exposure. The immune system is now upregulated. It's spitting out cytokines. And not only does this make people feel tired and they have sort of flu-like symptoms, but the cytokines themselves start to damage key centers in the brain. One of the most important are leptin receptors in the posterior hypothalamus. So if you have a patient, for example, that says, you know, um, my health was pretty good for a long time, and then all of a sudden I was feeling worse and worse, and I began gaining 30, 40 pounds, and yet I didn't change my lifestyle. I have no idea why. And now I have pain, and I'm depressed, and I'm tired, and I'm fat, and I don't know what's happening to my body. It's this. It's injury to the key control centers in the hypothalamus and related centers. So not only do they develop a very significant leptin resistance that you can't repair through diet alone, but they also get changes in the anterior hypothalamus. MSH starts to drop, melanocyte stimulating hormone, that master control hormone that I mentioned. Turns out, when you look at the literature on MSH and the melanocortin pathways in general, you will be surprised at how important these receptors are to sleep. So MSH is permissive for melatonin production. MSH is also permissive for endorphin production in the brain. If you just Google MSH and pain, there's a tremendous body of literature on why these patients fall into pain-related categories. So not only are they gaining weight and they can't sleep, but they're developing pain syndromes. Interestingly, MSH also controls tight junctions in the gut. So it turns out as the brain becomes inflamed, so too does the gut become compromised. 
and you can't fix the gut in this patient population with glutamine and arabinogalactans and probiotics and prebiotics and enzymes if the gut remains leaky. So as the brain goes, so does the gut. You gotta fix this first. So this is one of those patient populations where it's not fix the gut before I do anything else. It's fix the brain before I do anything else. In addition, the immune system overall becomes compromised. You get imbalances in hormones, including cortisol and ADH. Interestingly, aromatase activity peripherally also goes up. So these patients start converting testosterone to estrogen. They often have very high estrone levels, which also ends up being toxic to the brain itself. And their immune system becomes so compromised that begin, they begin to get secondary infections. Maybe one of the most important is something called Marcon's. It's a staph infection of the deep nasal passages. And this is a very insidious bug. It further releases a neurotoxin into the brain, which inflames the brain even more. So as MSH drops, secondary infections start to take hold, including respiratory infections, which are really problematic for this patient population. And if that weren't enough, we begin to see changes in the periphery with vascular endothelial growth factor and TGF-beta-1, which is a transcription factor produced by Th17 cells. You say, well, what is this stuff? Turns out when TGF-beta-1 goes up, the body's generally inflamed, but you get immune dysregulation, you get pulmonary problems, you get heart-related issues, and as vascular endothelial factor, um, growth factor becomes abnormal, the capillaries start to squeeze. So the heart has a hard time pumping blood to the periphery. That includes pulmonary hypertension. Now the muscles are starving for oxygen. Their VO2 max is dropping. Their exercise tolerance is dropping. Patients are reporting shortness of breath. And the heart is pushing against a pulmonary artery that's tight. So you get stretching of the right atria, which is where they get their palpitations and their shortness of breath. These patients often have already had a cardiac workup because no one knows why they're so compromised in their cardiopulmonary circuit. In addition to that, we begin to see release of complement factors, but not your normal C3, C4, C5, but instead split products down the C3A and C4A pathway. So the blood gets really, really inflamed by these weird complement proteins. So the body is generally inflamed from these alternate complements. And it turns out that the C3A in particular is linked to bacterial exposure. C4A is more linked to general exposures. And then finally, we see elevations in that MMP9, PI1, and even autoimmune antibodies, including cardiolipins. So this is the language of proteomics. The labs that I draw, MSH, TGF-beta-1, C3A, C4A, VEGF, MMP9, HLA sequences. You draw those all the time, right? You see these all the time, right? So this is the expression of innate immune system gone awry. This is likely a patient who's inherited the HLA defect. They're stuck in their innate immune response, and all of these things start to go up, and then you get a brain on fire phenomenon. And so they're tired, they're gaining weight, they're in pain, they have digestive complaints, they have tremendous amount of fatigue, and no one can find the problem. So here are the labs to order. I listed them for you, including the hormonal imbalances, D-dimer, leptin, which goes through the roof, all your Lyme testing. This is your roadmap for proteomics to say, is this, does this patient fall into this category? And don't forget, we swab patients' noses to see if they got that staph infection, because if you don't get rid of that, we know they can't get better. And I'm going to go back to that point in a little bit. We also know that if you inflame the brain enough, and we knew this based on the literature on traumatic brain injury, stress, concussions, chronic infections, that in fact the brain starts to change in structure. It's not just a functional issue that certain areas swell and other areas shrink. So we started to apply a novel um, software program called NeuroQuant. It literally measures, using a mathematical model or tool, key areas in the brain by size or volume. And what we found is that there was a fingerprint of injury in the brain that was unique to the exposure. In some patients, they'd have certain areas that were abnormal, which we mapped to mold. Other areas mapped to Lyme, 
Some map to concussion, others map to stress, and so on and so forth. That, in fact, these illnesses will leave a fingerprint on the central nervous system. And now we can use neuroquant as a way of identifying what we think the original exposure was, especially when patients claim that they have Lyme, but all of their labs and problems and neuroquant lead to mold. So we published a series of articles on that. So we look at the results of neuroquant, we um, evaluate the percent differences based on volume or size, and we're able to determine who's got mold, who's got Lyme, who's got other stuff. So this chronic inflammatory response, if we think about it, it's inflammation that won't turn off because of a trigger. It leads to all these secondary and tertiary consequences that you see every day in your practice. It's very common, and ultimately it injures the brain. Wow. And there's more, which I'll talk about at the end, which to me is extraordinary, and maps directly onto what Dr. Trope talked about. So what do I do? How do, we, how do I get through this? Well, welcome to the new world. And the new world is the blend of high science with natural products used in a very strategic way to deal with this patient population. And at the end of the roadmap is actually cure. You can actually cure these patients. And they will throw away their meds, they'll throw away their supplements, and they'll say, I can't believe I'm actually back to my old self. But you have to go through the process to, to get them there, and you have to understand what you're looking at. First, you need to identify, have they been exposed? Do they have the inflammation that we think they have? Did they fail their visual test? Are they in the 20% because of their HLA sequences? What does their brain scan show? We begin to map out and say, yep, you're in this category. So we say, OK, now we've got to answer the question, what were you exposed to, and is it still around? That's a hard question to answer. But once you get down the path, there are things you can do to begin to turn off all of this abnormal immune regulation, all of the secondary and tertiary consequences. You can even repair the brain. So we start with a low inflammatory, low mold diet. We, we begin with stress management and sleep support, because that's really important for helping the brain itself. We also do lots of lipids. And one of the injury sites is the cell membrane, including the double cell membrane around the mitochondria. So these patients need lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and then more healthy fats. You want to turn over the structure of the cell membrane itself. And we do that through phosphatidylcholine. We do that through special oils like fish oil or calamari oil. Black currant seed oil, it turns out these patients actually need healthy omega-6s because oftentimes that process is impaired too. And then uh, wheat germ oil, which is a structural lipid. So this is really important as a direct approach. And this is in the early phase. When we identify someone who's failed their visual test and we know they're sick, we get them on lipids right away. In addition to that, we start working to remove the inflammation from the brain. And we use extracts of ginseng and rhodiola, for example, which we know have anti-inflammatory benefits. Uh, curcumin or turmeric, we just need ones that cross the blood-brain barrier. In addition to magnesium, and there are newer forms of magnesium that actually get into the brain and turn off that neuroexcitation and neuroinflammation. And then, in, and then we do detox protocol, usually powders, just like what Dr. Bonica talked about, which is how do we more globally sort of rein in inflammation and start a gentle detox in these patients? It's really important to begin them on that process. So we're altering their diet, we're globally reducing inflammation, but we're targeting the brain. So this is how we turn off inflammation. We then deal with exposure elimination. This is key. If they're still infected, you kill the bugs. If they're living in mold, they have to remediate it. You can't get these patients better if the biotoxin is still present. And then we go about the business of further reducing their toxic burden. And this is key. Turns out that a lot of the inflammation can be dragged out of the body literally through the digestive tract. It's not using anti-inflammatories. We're using a different strategy to take advantage of how we know the body processes these inflammatory proteins. And the best site to grab that inflammation, it turns out, is inside the gut. We then clear out the nasal passages with that icky Marcons, so we use nasal sprays. And then finally, we go to the gut directly, and we start testing the gut. We see if it's leaky. We do food sensitivity panels and so on and so forth to start clearing out the digestive tract. If you think about this piece of reducing toxic burden, this first section is all about further reducing brain inflammation. The second section is respiratory inflammation. The third section is gut inflammation. 
So we're ratcheting patients down in a very specific order. And notice gut comes third, not first. We then do metabolic balancing. This is where I think patients are doing better. Their cells are starting to wake up. They can release the toxins like heavy metals and chemicals really directly. We then do some hormone balancing and water balance. And then finally, we end with resolution and repair. How do we get the immune system fully back to normal? So this is your natural toolkit. These are the things that I think you should be reaching for when you have patients who fall into this category. So foundations, as I said, lots of lipids, PC, calamari, black currant seed, and polycosinol, and then reducing neuroinflammation with ginseng extracts, rhodiola, curcumin, magnesium, and a detox protocol. You cannot imagine how much better people feel right away because they're reducing inflammation, their leptin levels are getting better, their pain is improving, they're starting to lose a little bit of weight. So how do I protect the brain? Well, one is turmeric or curcumin, the curcuminoids. It's a relative of ginger. Uh, it was cultivated through Ayurvedic medicine in India. It has a variety of anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties um, and, and other properties as well. We all know about this. Um, but there are forms of curcumin that work better in terms of crossing the blood-brain barrier. So there's a, a new, newer product in the market that's bound to a fenugreek ligand that crosses the blood-brain and gets into uh, the central nervous system. Many products don't have that capacity. So we use this now exclusively because while there's a lot of good basic science research and animal studies on curcumin and turmeric, we know all about it. For our particular purposes in the SERS population, I need something that gets into the brain specifically. And so when it's bound to the ligand, we know that there's a much higher absorption rate all the way through the, the barriers, the gut, the vascular, and the blood-brain barrier. So there's much better bioavailability. So what's your dosing? So in your standard dosing for curcumin, typically, depending on the research study, it's four to 500 milligrams. It turns out that when you hi have higher absorption uh, products, you can do 100 milligrams because it has a much, much better therapeutic benefit. The pharmacokinetics and dynamics, as we call it, are, are the profile is much improved. Uh, there are some side effects. Usually it's GI. Sometimes the curcuminoids can be an irritant to the digestive tract, and there are some drug interactions as well. Ginseng too, Eleutherococcus, so Siberian ginseng, um, which contains a variety of compounds that together as sort of a bioactive family re regulate the uh, stress response. But interestingly, in particular, when you look at how a number of these compounds work, they work specifically by actually protecting the brain, which makes sense because when people are under stress, it's the brain that's not only controlling the stress response, but actually taking the biggest hit. That as much as inflammation affects the body globally, stress in particular, um, as a function of its interaction with the immune system uh, damages the brain. So adaptogens generally, ginseng in particular, has very neuroprotective qualities. Rhodiola too um, has the same. So there's a variety of mechanisms of action, but I care about the first bullet point, which is anti-inflammatory and neuroprotective. And there's tons of research now on the gen, uh, ginsenicides that do that as a group. So the RB line, the RG line, the eleutherosides, all of them together are very neuroprotective. So this is why we get them on a ginseng. So 400 milligrams, two to three times per day uh, is the standard dose. What about, what about exposures? So you've gone through your process, you've given some lipids, you've given some neuroprotective agents, you started to change their diet, you've generally detoxified them, but then we have to deal with the exposures themselves. I don't have enough time uh, to tell you exactly how to get rid of Lyme. Um, but you do have to learn how to do that if you're going to take on this patient population. Uh, there's a few tricks that are available now that are pretty good in that regard. So Artemisia, uh, this is wormwood, and uh, very good for parasites um, as well as bacteria and even viruses. There's a variety of research studies in the clinical literature on its ability to eliminate infections. This is a standard, and in fact, it's recommended around the world in that regard. That's hard to see. Um, so there's a variety of pathogens that it's been studied with. Um, for our purposes in particular, Babesia is probably most important because, in fact, that's one of the co-infections that people can be exposed to in a tick bite. And Babesia, it turns out, is a parasite. So Artemisia in particular is really good in this patient population, but it has even broader activity than just as an antiparasitic. There's a number of clinical studies on this compound. 
and it even works as an anti-inflammatory as well. So we use a lot of artemisia in, in, in our practice. Myrrh, myrrh is an interesting one. Um, so it's a gum resin out of Ayurvedic medicine, and it has a number of properties to it that also helps with pathogens as well. There are several clinical studies that have used high-dose myrrh in chronic infections. What's unique about this is that it just needs to be pulsed. So all the studies, um, and there are several of them, show that um, there is some positive benefit except for schistosomiasis, and the dosage consideration is pulsing, and then you break for four to 14 days. In addition to that, how do I reduce the toxic burden? So I'm quickly skipping over that one because this topic is really important. So these patients are still inflamed. You've sort of generally targeted their brain. You've begun to talk about exposure in general. But we can now get a little more specific, and this is where the magic typically happens in this patient population. And the first thing to recognize is that the inflammation that's produced in the periphery traffics through the vascular system. It's then absorbed and emulsified in the bile and deposited directly in the digestive tract, and there it sits. These fat-soluble compounds that either can be disposed of in the stool or reabsorbed through enterohepatic circulation. So there's this continuous cycle of production and reabsorption that happens in these patients. As much as the brain on, is on fire, so too is the gut. So we've done some things to try and sedate the brain, but we have some very specialized tools to disrupt that enteropatic circulation. And it turns out there are some medications that we can use, but there are also natural compounds that also do the same thing. And um, I will continually gr give credit to uh, Sarah because she found really one of the only studies in the literature, and actually we're, we're finding more now. So I have a couple pharmacists that are scouring. Um, we looked for things that actually are very good at binding the inflammation in the gut. There aren't that many because these are negatively charged, very small molecules of inflammation that need a, a specific receptor site and confirmation that's positively charged to grab on and suck out these inflammatory compounds. Turns out the prescription version is cholestyramine, which is an old um, cholesterol medication. But okra has really been one of the only natural compounds that will do the same thing. It just doesn't have as many binding sites. So it's a gentler version. But when you add fiber to the patient's dietary intake, it improves the patient's ability to remove the inflammation. We are now on the okra fiber kick in my practice. And patients, I have to eat okra? And I say, well, you can. Um, and we're, we're now really investigating what are the unique compounds inside okra in particular that have the highest binding capacity. Um, and I work with a couple PharmDs that are experts in pharmacognosy that are really good at identifying what are the unique constituents. We're getting closer at, at identifying that piece. Because you're using a binder that binds onto all sorts of things, you want them on a good multivitamin and mineral. In addition to that, because the bile is the root of traffic, we get them on some ox bile to help produce bile so they're not getting so stuck through the biliary tree. And then they need a little bit of liver support with N-acetylcysteine to boost glutathione production. What you're ultimately doing is trying to suck out that inflammation to the point where they can pass their visual test. So this is the step after a month or two where we say, okay, repeat your visual test. If you failed it several months ago, we've turned off the fire in your brain, we've removed your exposure, and now we're dispensing of all this inflammation that's accumulated. Great, you're feeling better. Not perfect, but good. Repeat your visual test. Doc Heyman, I passed my visual test. I can't believe it. I took it 12 times. I kept failing, failing, failing. I was feeling awful. And finally, I turned a corner, and I passed. And it's because you drain the body of these toxins. Now they're ready to go to the respiratory tract and deal with the bugs in their nose, which acts as a secondary source of inflammation for the brain, which is the staph infection, the Marcons. And we eliminate that. We've actually had a lot of success with the silver spray. We used to use antibiotics. Turns out silver combined with a biofilm buster, EDTA, which we usually use for heavy metals, is actually really good at degrading biofilm, is excellent for reducing the Marcons. Once they clear that, now we can go to the gut. So what do you think is happening? That MSH is coming up, their leptin levels are dropping, their pain is improved, their energy is better, they're losing some weight, and the gut lining is starting to seal up 
because the MSH is climbing and the total body burden of inflammation is dropping. Now, all of your products related to digestive health start to work really well. The digestive enzymes, the prebiotics, the probiotics, the things that heal the gut lining like glutamine and marshmallow, and you know all the, the actors. They don't typically work until you do this. You can see some improvement if you do that stuff first. You'll see some clinical change. Works even better if you kind of preload them with all these other clinical strategies. You gotta fix the brain, you gotta fix the respiratory tract, then you can go to the gut. And we do that um, through a variety of mechanisms, including butyrate. So butyrate is an incredible and sort of under-recognized natural compound that is a precursor to resolvents. So when you consume oral butyrate, you raise resolvin content in the body, which acts as a switch to turn off inflammation. I know Dr. Trope talked about that. So basically, resolvins bind to what are called uh, G-protein coupled receptors inside macrophages. It's a lock and key phenomenon. And these macrophages go from these big, burly, what we call M1 phenotypes that squirting out tons of cytokines. You give them resolvins, and the macrophages go back to their M2 anti-inflammatory state nice and quiet and docile. So butyrate is really good at that. You can give resolvins, you can give fish oil, you can give, actually one of the best things to give, which is very expensive, my patients, some patients love it when I recommend it, uh, is caviar. So caviar is very high in uh, resolving content. And so too is anchovies and, and sardines. Um, but it sounds very sophisticated when you say, well just eat caviar every day. <laughs> and very expensive, of course. So we want to disrupt that enteropathic circulation, which is really important. We use, I can sometimes write for cholestyramine because it acts as a binder, but it turns out ochre works really well too. You get about 30% activity. And hint, you can get even better binding capacity from beets. So beets are about 50% of cholestyramine binding because it works as a great drain and there's all sorts of research now going on in beets. It's kind of one of the new hot things. Turns out it actually functions like ochre and cholestyramine, and even better. Then we want to get rid of those marcons, those nasty staph bugs in the nose. They release something called a paleotoxin directly into the brain, right through the olfactory bulb. It's a very tiny, tiny neurotoxin that further injures the brain tissue. So even when you've turned off the fire and you've removed the exposure and you've you know, healed so much of what's going on, they still have another engine of inflammation, which only really hops on when MSH is low. That's why they have it. So now that you sort of begun to correct the central issue, you gotta deal with the bug. And all this was research out of Australia a number of years ago, and I, you know, I've become a, a big believer. You can use BEG, which is Bactroban EDTA gentamicin, but I now more than ever like silver EDTA which works really well. Another reason why we do this, and I said I was gonna tell you a second reason why it's so important for getting rid of Marcons, not only does it further reduce the fire in the brain, but it turns out if Marcons is present, remember there are two issues with stuff related to genes in this patient population. 22% carry one of nine alleles, which make them vulnerable, but then it turns out if they're inflamed enough, hundreds of genes turn on like light switches in the mitochondria and they won't turn off ever. When we give our special therapies at the end of all this to try and correct some of those genomic issues, the final sort of paint, as we say, and it's called VIP, it's a nasal spray called vasoactive intestinal peptide. This ultimate therapy, which actually works to turn off gene response, it doesn't work if Marcon's is present. You cannot get final cure if these bugs are still around. So you gotta eliminate them from the nose or you can't get their last correction. We then go into metabolic balance. This is where their pH is starting to climb, their gut is really doing well, their brain is less inflamed. Now you can start doing a deeper, quote, detox. You can start mobilizing heavy metals and chemicals from the periphery and patients will do really well. After that, as we're clearing out receptor sites and enzymes and substrates, because we're offloading that heavy metal and chemical content, now you can start balancing their hormones effectively. I find the botanicals work really well at this point. Usually there's a lot of hormonal balances in the beginning and they start to resolve as the patient is improving. 
And just like fixing the gut too early doesn't work, quote, balancing hormones doesn't work either. And remember, their aromatase enzyme is really working over time. So all you end up doing, if you give them estrogen, for example, or testosterone, you just make a lot of estrone, which is terrible for them. Um, got a lot of steps here. Is that 12 weeks? <laughs> 12 weeks. Yeah, eight, 12 to 18 months. Yeah, 12 to 18 months of resolving all of this. But you know what? Patients are feeling better and better and better, and they're totally bought in. They go, this is great, because they've been sick for 20 years. You know, it's amazing to watch them unfold. You gotta let them know up front how long they've been there. Yeah, a lot of that. But you know what? The two big things that I tell them about is we got to get you to pass your visual test and clear your Marcons. Once you do that, you're going to feel like almost your old self, but not quite. So how do we do that? How do we get them to their old self? Well, I remeasure some of those proteomic markers at the very end if their MMP9 is high. Turns out amylose, which is a starch in the diet, excites MMP9. Um, so we want to get amylose out of the diet if they're still eating some of these starchy vegetables. Boswellia is great at blocking MMP9. We then remeasure C4A and C C3 of those kind of alternate complements. Fish oil and, and resolvins and CoQ10 and red yeast rice help there too. And then the penul penultimate step is TGF beta 1, carnitine, resveratrol. Those are very good at blocking down on TGF beta 1. And then we get to the last step, which is a special nasal spray. So low amylose diet, I put it in the slides for you to see what it is. This is our, basically our handout that we give to our patients. This is kind of a unique diet, but it's really related to MMP9. Boswelli is a, a wonderful traditional anti-inflammatory. It's an extract of frankincense um, and specifically um, blocks macrophage production of lox and cox, and in particular decreases MMP9. 400 milligrams two to three times a day, standardized to at least 25% boswellic acids. So you get through all of this. You turn off the fire in the brain. You clear the marcons. You fix the gut. You balance their hormones. You turn off residual inflammation through boswellia and resveratrol and carnitine. And all the blood labs are back to normal. But guess what's not back to normal? That genomic expression. And we started looking at this patient population, basically asking the same question that Dr. Trope has been asking. When people get sick, what are their genes doing? Well, it turns out we have 30 to 35,000 genes in the human genome, so that's a really large thing to scan. So we started there. We then isolated 2,000 genes that seemed to be underlying this illness. And then we got down to 900, which is the study I'll show you. And then last month, we isolated 215 genes that turn on and won't turn off in very specific sequences. If it's mold, Lyme, post-Lyme, we can tell now. And what we're measuring is the RNA that's being produced off the DNA. This is the difference, again, between genetics and genomics. Really important to understand. Those 215 genes, if I look at them from their structure, I could say, oh, 215 are normal. You inherited a totally regular set of mitochondrial genes. But guess what? They're all on at the same time, and they won't turn off. And they tell the body to make inflammation. And one of the responses in the mitochondria as a result of this is that there are cell danger signals that are produced, where in fact, and this is really interesting, of the 215, there's a set that underlie what we call the hypometabolic response of the cell. Hypometabolism is a searchable term. It's in the literature. It's part of cell danger response. Basically, the body goes into this downgraded mode where it says it's been shocked by something. I'm turning everything off until I can figure out what to do. And guess what happens? People get tired. They start gaining weight. They develop insulin resistance and leptin resistance and chronic inflammation that there's a variety of secondary and tertiary consequences that occur because of these hypometabolic changes. This began to underlie from a genomic perspective, why these patients are so miserable. So as these genes turn on, they get chronic inflammation, they're hypometabolic, and they actually slow their aging process through what are called the mTOR sequences. So mTORs become impaired too. There's five genes of the 215 that are responsible for aging in the body. And if you really want to look at advanced research, just Google mTOR. You will find tons of fascinating studies on the role mTOR plays on accelerated aging. So these patients are aging faster, they're tired, they're chronically inflamed, and they're gaining weight. And it's, we've isolated the 215.
And it's different ones out of the 215 that turn on depending on lime, mold, so on and so forth. So even though you've turned off all their gene, or their, you've turned off all the blood inflammation, the proteomics are normal, you still have the abnormal gene response and you still have an injured brain. So this field of transcriptomics, which is using and measuring RNA through very specialized devices, is a breakthrough for us. And we know that microRNA, long non-coding RNA, is the expression of how we regulate epigenetics. Right? So they are cell signals that turn on and off and re-regulate gene expression. So we do transcriptomics in our research. And that means we look at the 215 genes, we measure the RNA production, we look at microRNA sequences, and we can tell what's going on with these patients now. This is our patient population with 900 genes in the mitochondria. Up is orange and red, down is blue and purple. Up is abnormal, down is normal. And these are Lyme and mold patients. And what we found is that in the 900 gene sequences, 500 extra genes were turned on in Lyme, and 700 of the 900 genes were turned on inappropriately in mold. That it's like all the instruments in the symphony are playing at the same time. And there's no music, there's no harmony or melody, it's just all noise, all the way down to the cell level. Because the instruction set is all playing at the same time. There's too much RNA. Cell didn't know what to do. So, blood labs are normal. Symptoms are pretty much improved, but they're not all the way back. How do we re-regulate gene response? We need cell signaling. We need microRNA. So I got inspired earlier thinking we need to take this patient population where we gave them a prescription called VIP, vasoactive intestinal peptide. This is a neuropeptide that you can have compounded into a nasal spray. And we gave those patients VIP and we said, come back to us when you feel normal, when you feel like your old self. I know we've gotten you 90% of the way, but we need the last 10%. And we said, don't come back, keep spraying your nose with VIP until you feel normal. The average return to us was four months. We remeasured their genetic expression. We wanted to know what their genes were doing. We had a suspicion that VIP would do something positive. We had already published studies that VIP heals the brain because it's an anti-inflammatory for the central nervous system. So that was a breakthrough on its own, that in fact even the brain injury responds to VIP, but we didn't know what was going on at the genetic level. So they came back, and remember, up is orange and red, down is blue and purple, down is better, and this is what happened. All the genes went back to normal. That's cure. These patients are not cured until you do this. We now have a model to take this group, this 20% population, get them to the point where we can isolate just abnormal gene expression, and then give them treatments to see what really works at the genomic level. We've, you know, this is 10 years of research that we now know, and a really common, common problem, we can then ask that question. 215 genes, 30,000, 2,000, 900, 215. Responsible for common symptoms in your practice. Probably more than 20% because we don't see healthy people usually. We just see the ones that have all these complaints the fatigue and the weight gain and the pain and the brain fog and the digestive complaints and so on and so forth. And what's happening now is that the high science of where medicine is going is beginning to intersect with what we've known for 100 years, if not thousands. We see in our practices patients getting better almost miraculously when we give certain things. But now we have a model for understanding why that is. It's in the magic of genetic expression, most likely. The switches that turn on and off gene responses is where all clinical medicine is going to go. So just becoming familiar with the language of genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics, I know it all is weird and is new, but you're going to have to get used to it because you're going to just hear more about it especially when you look at unique compounds like protomorphogens that influence genetic expression. So, VIP dosing, probably not that important. Here's the biotoxin evaluation process once again, stepwise to verify are they in that category, did they fail their visual test, do they have the symptoms, are their proteomics abnormal, are they genetically susceptible, and then what do we do about it? Turn off the fire in the brain, 
turn off the fire in the respiratory tract, turn off the fire in the gut, and then resolve and repair. Here's your toolkit. I've talked about all of this. So I know that was a whirlwind tour, but it was meant to be kind of a capstone to create a framework for all of the talks that happened before is to say, who are these people in real life? You know, we're talking about genetic expression and inflammation and a brain on fire, and you've heard all this throughout the day, but do these patients exist? Are they ones that I even see? What are my tools to get them better? And it turns out, at least in this category of this chronic inflammatory response, where individuals are exposed to a biotoxin, they ignite a fire that won't turn off, you, as a community, I think are really well positioned to deal with some of the hardest cases that any clinician sees. Because by definition, chronic fatigue is chronic, fibromyalgia is chronic, atypical depression is chronic, obesity is a scourge. And it's very hard to get people to lose weight and feel better. And even when they just make dietary changes, they'll say, oh, it's stubborn. You know, I've tried to make these changes. I pulled out gluten. I've been low carb. I've been keto. I've been like vigo, keto, you know, <laughs> nuts every other day, intermittent fasting, you know, whatever. And I still can't lose weight. I mean, I know you see these patients. Usually it's a fire in the brain. And until you correct these issues, the genomic, the proteomic, even the structural injury to the brain, you can't get these people better. So if all you did was just review the symptom list and have people do the online visual test, and if they fail it, you know what you have. Doesn't mean you need to treat it, but you can certainly support them. You can give them a label and say, hey, I, I think I know what's actually going on with you. And if you don't feel confident dealing with it, at least maybe you can refer to someone who does. But you actually already have a lot of the tools at your disposal. The key is knowing which tools, in which order, to get them better. That's primary in this patient population. So I know I ran over, but thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It was good to see all of you.